and my name is Liz Wilson. I'm from OLLI at Stony Brook University, and we welcome you to today's lecture. Um, Helen Harrison is um, the director of the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center in East Hampton, New York. The museum is a National Historic Landmark and is the former home and studio of Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner, two of the foremost abstract expressionist painters. Helen is an art historian, museum director, and journalist who specializes in modern American art. Please welcome Helen Harrison. Thank you, everybody. I'm really happy to be here today. I want to thank Liz and Brianne for organizing this Zoom event and for walking me through the technical part, which I hope will go smoothly. Uh, as as uh, Liz said, I, I'll be happy to take questions at the end, but if any of you do want to use the chat feature while I'm speaking, please feel free to do that. Uh, let me put my presentation up. And there we are. Can everyone see the slide? If you want to raise your hands, just let me know that you can see it. Okay, great. My talk today is about two people from very different backgrounds. Jackson Pollock, who was born in Cody, Wyoming in 1912, and Lee Krasner, born in Brooklyn in 1908 and how they found common ground in the New York City art world in the 1930s and 40s. The only things they had in common were their working class backgrounds and the ambition to become artists. Firmly rooted in the New York cosmopolitan milieu where they met in 1941, they later branched out to establish themselves in rural Long Island, where they painted the works that changed the course of modern art. How they got there and what they did there is what I want to discuss. Pollock's first formal statement about his motivations was an interview published in the February 1944 issue of Arts and Architecture magazine. He had just had his first solo exhibition at Peggy Guggenheim's gallery in New York City. He had been living in the city since 1930 when he quit high school in Los Angeles and moved east to study at the Art Students League. To the question of whether being a Westerner affected his work, Pollock answered indirectly, even a bit disingenuously, but at some length, I'm quoting him now. I've always been impressed with the plastic qualities of American Indian art, he said. The Indians have the true painter's approach in their capacity to get hold of appropriate images and in their understanding of what constitutes painterly subject matter. Their color is essentially Western, their vision has the basic universality of all real art. Some people find references to American Indian art and calligraphy in parts of my pictures. That wasn't intentional, probably was the result of early memories and enthusiasms." Unquote. During Pollock's childhood, the family moved restlessly around the Southwest. At the age of eight, when the family was briefly living in Janesville, near the Nevada border in Northern California, he and his brothers reportedly witnessed the Wadatkut tribe's annual bear dance and were told captivating Indian legends by a Wadatkut Indian woman, Nora Jack, who worked for the family. Now his affinity with what he called the Indian sand painting of the West, quite famously, is well documented but there's no evidence that he saw sand painters at work on the Navajo reservation when the family lived in Phoenix. Indeed, it's highly unlikely that a Diné youngster would have been admitted to such a sacred healing ceremony. It is known, however, that he attended the sand painting demonstrations at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City in conjunction with the 1941 exhibition, Indian Art of the United States, to which I will be returning later. The family first lived in Phoenix for two, three and a half years when Pollock was an infant and left when he was five. He would hardly have been wandering the countryside at that age. They moved back briefly in 1923, so his memories of that area date from that year. He may also have learned about sand painting at that time, even if he didn't witness it firsthand. 
The following summer, when Pollock was 12, his father took the boys on a hike to the cliff dwellings in Tonto National Forest. It was there that Jackson saw numerous petroglyphs and was especially impressed by the marks of human hands on the walls. These may indeed have been among the early memories and enthusiasms to which he referred in his arts and architecture interview, and handprints would indeed make appearances in his later work. His feeling for the land's vast horizontality is also a product of the family's Phoenix years. After several aborting, uh, uh, excuse me, abortive farming ventures, his father had become a land surveyor and supervised road crews. Pollock and his brothers occasionally worked with him, and they had ample opportunity to appreciate the landscape's awesome expansiveness when the work took them to the Grand Canyon in 1927. And if any of you have been there on the North Rim, the road that leads to the North Rim was constructed by his father's road crew. Pollock often claimed that he preferred painting large canvases and felt more at home, more at ease in a big area. Yet I would argue that it's a mistake to correlate the size of his paintings with the vastness of Western topography. I believe that his sense of space, at least in pictorial terms, is more a product of his desire for mural commissions, an impulse stimulated by his admiration of contemporary mural painters and the opportunities presented by the advent of the New Deal patronage projects. From the time he became aware of the work of the Mexican muralists, especially Jose Clemente Orozco's frescoes, which his eldest brother Charles, also an artist, told him were, quote, the finest painting that has been done, I think, since the 16th century, unquote, Pollock wanted to paint big wall pictures. Before he left Los Angeles, at Charles's urging to study with the muralist Thomas Hart Benton at the Art Students League in New York, the two brothers went to see Orozco's recent lunch in Claremont, California. The subject is the Titan Prometheus stealing fire from the gods and giving it to humanity, a powerful myth rendered in uh, suitably monumental imagery. It made a deep impression on the 18-year-old Pollock whose admiration for Orozco was heightened by watching the master at work on his frescoes in the New School for Social Research in New York City the following winter. Benton was also painting murals for the building and he encouraged his students' ambitions by involving them as helpers on his commission. He also encouraged them to work from their personal experience. Unfortunately, Pollock never mastered the technical skills that would have qualified him to paint a mural for the WPA Federal Art Project or the Treasury Section of Fine Arts during the New Deal, when many of his contemporaries were decorating public buildings under government auspices. He worked for the WPA off and on from its inception in 1935 until it ended in 1943 but his project work was confined to easel paintings and prints. Not many of them survive, but among those that do, several used Western subject matter based on his recollections of farm life and his observations on the three cross-country road trips he took during those years. It would not be until late 1943, after the project ended, that he painted his first mural-sized canvas. By that time, he had abandoned representational imagery and anecdotal subject matter in favor of an increasingly abstract symbolic visual language that clearly draws to some extent on Native American sources, as you saw in that earlier canvas that I showed you. While he was receiving a regular government paycheck, Pollock engaged in extracurricular activities that would have a decisive effect on his development. In 1936, the Mexican muralist David Alfaro Siqueiros, whom Pollock had met briefly in Los Angeles, arrived in New York City and established what he called an experimental workshop. Jackson and his brother Sandy were among the young artists who helped make posters, banners, and a float for that year's May Day Parade. The charismatic Siqueiros encouraged workshop members to use unorthodox materials and methods to create novel effects. He especially liked quick drying industrial paints. His nickname was Il Duco. And his workshop is where Pollock first worked with liquid paint. 
Workshop members recalled pouring it, flinging it, and adding grit to it, all techniques that Pollock would later apply to his most famous canvases. In fact, one can see poured painting in his work as early as this collaborative painting that he made with Jerome Kamrowski and William Baziotis, and several works from 1943, four years before it became his primary medium. Notwithstanding his ambition, Pollock painted a mere handful of canvases that could be considered mural size, and only two that were done for specific architectural settings. A mural, by definition, requires suitable wall space, as well as someone to underwrite the work. For, while a public building, uh, for, for a while, public buildings provided the walls and the WPA was the patron, but Pollock missed that boat. Fortunately for him, Peggy Guggenheim stepped in and gave him the chance he had dreamed of since he had watched Benton and Orozco at work more than a decade earlier. But no other private patrons followed her lead. So Pollock hit on a compromise. In his unsuccessful 1947 request for a Guggenheim Fellowship, he dismissed easel painting as a dying form and stated his intention, quote, to paint large movable pictures which will function between the easel and the mural, unquote. By then, he had moved from New York City to Springs, a rural community on Eastern Long Island, where his property had a sweeping view across a salt marsh toward the bay. The Atlantic Ocean, which he had earlier analogized to the vast horizontality of the Western landscape, was just down the road. His studio, in a converted barn, was not much bigger than his workspace at 46 East 8th Street in Greenwich Village, which is where he had lived for about 10 years, but the physical environment outside was totally different. There's no question that the openness of the coastal landscape, the lambent maritime light, and the prominence of natural phenomena that are masked in an urban setting profoundly influenced his development. His newly expansive compositions, regardless of their actual size, were more responses to his immediate surroundings than products of residual childhood memories. The body of water you see behind Pollock and Krasner in this 1949 photograph by Martha Holmes is Akabonic Creek, which borders the east side of their property. During their first months in Springs, before they took title to the property, they, worked, they both worked in the house. Pollock's studio in a small upstairs bedroom looked out on the creek, and the view evidently had a significant impact on him since his first uh, series done in that space was titled the Akabonic Creek Series. Not that they are landscape paintings. The cryptic symbolic imagery and canvases from the series, for example, this one, the, the key, relates to pictographic work from the previous couple of years. But the colors are brighter, the paint application is lighter, and the mood is much more upbeat than in his earlier work. According to Krasner, this was the first canvas Pollock painted on the studio floor. One might question the reason for laying out the unstretched fabric horizontally and kneeling down to work on it, since it does not use the pouring technique that required a flat orientation. But the painting is seven feet wide, and the room in which he worked was, had no wall space big enough to mount it on, so the floor was the most practical option. And I hope that you'll all at some point take advantage when we reopen of coming to the Pollock Krasner house and seeing the original studio for yourselves. In terms of Pollock's use of pictographic imagery, it was probably not his experiences out west that provided the raw material. The masked figures, costumed dancers, and magical creatures that populate his paintings and drawings from the late 1930s and early 1940s owe a much greater debt to his regular visits to the ethnographic collections in New York City museums and to the material he saw in the MoMA exhibition I mentioned earlier, as well as his interest in the Mexican muralist's use of indigenous precedents, especially in Orozco's work. As Ellen Landau points out in her monograph on Pollock, his friends recalled his fascination with the dual role of the shaman slash artist in native cultures, 
and his attraction to the shaman-induced transformations between human and animal form that are ubiquitous in Indian art. And the two examples of the masks that I'm showing you here are both from New York City uh, ethnographic collections, and the one on the lower right was in the MoMA exhibition. One of those friends, Peter Busa, was involved in a group that came to be known as the Indian Space Painters. Their aim, to paraphrase art historian Barbara Hollister, was to use the devices of tribal art to fuse formalism with surrealism's inner vision. Like Pollock, who knew them but was not a member of the group, they visited the Museum of the American Indian and the American Museum of Natural History, which contained not only the kind of things they might, that Pollock might have seen in the Southwest, but also material from all over the Americas. Like Pollock, they were inspired by the 1941 MoMA exhibition and collected copies of the Smithsonian Institution's massive report of the Bureau of American Ethnology, in which numerous examples of Native American art are illustrated. They shared with him a sense of the magic inherent in such imagery, as well as regarding it as an alternative to School of Paris abstraction. Nor should its Jungian implications be overlooked. The European Surrealists and their American counterparts alike were interested in Jung's concept of the collective unconscious, the reservoir of what he called primordial images. Pollock discussed Jung's theories with Dr. Joseph Henderson, a psychiatrist who treated him in 1939 and 1940 in a fruitless effort to arrest his alcoholism. Pollock took some of his drawings to their therapy sessions and as Henderson later told Jeffrey Potter, one of Pollock's biographers, they talked about them as spontaneous products of the collective unconscious. Jung wrote that such primordial images represent, quote, the accumulated experience of thousands of years of struggle for adaptation and existence. Every great experience in life, every profound conflict evokes the treasured wealth of these images and brings them into inner perception. End quote. And with cataclysmic conflict then raging in Europe, is it any wonder that a wellspring of such source material was opened? Now, as these sketches illustrate, during the late 1930s and early 40s, Pollock was strongly influenced by Picasso, who in 1937 set an example that directly challenged Pollock's own ambitions. With the advent of Guernica, Picasso painted a movable picture that functioned between the easel and the mural. Sound familiar? His forms were stark, powerful, dynamic, and appropriate for imagery that conveyed strong emotion without sentimentality. And his message was both timely in its condemnation of the bombing of a Basque village during the Spanish Civil War, and timeless in its indictment of war's brutal violence. After its debut at the Paris World's Fair in July 1937, the painting was widely publicized. It toured Europe until 1939, when it arrived in New York City, where Pollock was able to study it firsthand. In essence, I'm arguing that Pollock's aesthetic was more directly informed by the New York art scene than by his Western childhood. This is not to say, however, that those early memories and enthusiasms played no role. It's simply that those predilections were reinforced significantly by the zeitgeist in New York, where they were shared by his peers, and where he encountered the work of established artists like Picasso, the Mexican muralists, and the surrealists, whose ideas interested him more than their paintings did. As he said in the Arts and Architecture interview, I am particularly impressed with their concept, this is the Surrealists, of the source of art being the unconscious. However much he valued internal stimuli, Pollock was equally attuned to the outside world around him. From the time of his move to Springs in 1945 until he ceased painting 10 years later, his imagery was often inspired by his surroundings. The Akabana Creek series was followed by another called Sounds in the Grass, all over abstractions in which he developed visual analogies to natural phenomena. The seasons are reflected in Banners of Spring, 
summertime, and autumn rhythm. The sea was another important reference, as in Full Fathom 5, Ocean Grayness, Sea Change, and the Deep. Celestial analogies include comet, galaxy, reflections of the Big Dipper, and grayed rainbow, in which the spectrum of colors is subsumed in a swirling fog. Given the fact that Pollock's mature work was so strongly indebted to his immediate environment, I would suggest that his Western persona was cultivated precisely to distinguish him from the European modernists. But his cowboy style, remarked on by many of his associates, especially early in his career, was largely a pose. Yes, he was born in Cody, Wyoming, a residential development just outside Yellowstone Park, named for one of its investors, Buffalo Bill, and which, as you can see, bears an uncanny resemblance to uh, Levittown. But the family moved on when Pollock was only 10 months old, and he never returned to what in the early 20th century was billed as the Wild West. He never roped a steer or rode the range. In fact, he was afraid of horses and exaggerated shamelessly when he boasted to the writer Burton Ruscha that at the age of 14, he was milking a dozen cows twice a day. That remark was included in a 1950 New Yorker article in which Ruscha reported on a visit to Pollock and his wife, Lee Krasner, in Springs. Pollock's references to his Western childhood evidently prompted Krasner to reinforce his status as a homegrown innovator. Jackson's work is full of the West, she told Ruscha. That's what gives it that feeling of spaciousness. It's what makes it so American, she gushed. Pollock's response to this rather blatant attempt to set him apart from the European tradition was, as Ruscha described it, a reflexive scowl. In the 1944 Arts and Architecture article, Pollock had acknowledged that, quote, the important painting of the last hundred years was done in France and maintained that, quote, the idea of an isolated American painting would seem absurd. The basic problems of contemporary painting are independent of any one country, unquote. If he still believed that statement, Krasner's assertion contradicted it, which perhaps accounts for the scowl. For however much Pollock's character was formed by his roots in the West, he was unquestionably aware that his art owed as much to New York and Paris as it did to Arizona and California. As for Krasner herself, birth name Lena Krasner with two S's and later known as Lenore, her artistic roots were firmly planted in School of Paris modernism, despite the fact that her career had germinated in those hotbeds of orthodoxy the Cooper Union, and the National Academy of Design. As a teenager, she had commuted from her native Brooklyn to Washington Irving High School in Manhattan, the only public high school in New York City that offered an art major for girls. Later, at the Women's Art School of the Cooper Union, where she studied from 1926 to 1928, and the National Academy of Design from 1928 to 1932, she received thorough technical training and seemed destined to become a traditional representational painter. This self-portrait, painted in her parents' basement in East New York, illustrates her early direction. But dissatisfaction with the Academy began to stir soon thereafter, specifically in 1929 with the opening of the Museum of Modern Art. It was, she later said, quote, an upheaval for me, something like reading Nietzsche or Schopenhauer, unquote. Having given up her parents' Orthodox Judaism some years earlier, she adopted modernism as her religion and worshiped at its temple, MoMA. And Krasner's private life soon became equally unorthodox. The same year that MoMA opened, she fell in love with a fellow academy student, Igor Pantuhoff, and soon began living with him. She allowed her family to believe that they were married, but they weren't. Under Igor's influence, she adopted a glamorous persona, and the couple were a fixture of the downtown Bohemian social scene. They lived together until late 1939, by which time the 31-year-old Krasner was well known in the minuscule avant-garde as an up-and-coming young modernist. 
Her early experiments with abstraction were tentative, involving still lifes derived from Cezanne and especially Matisse, as illustrated by this 1935 still life based on Matisse's gourds, which MoMA had just acquired. That year also marked the start of the WPA Federal Art Project, which for which both she and Pollock would work on and off for the next eight years. But in spite of this professional validation, she became dissatisfied with her work and decided to change direction. In 1937, she enrolled in the Hans Hoffmann School of Fine Art in Greenwich Village and was associated with the school for four years. Hoffmann, a German emigre who had been in Paris from 1904 to 1914, taught the principles of Cubism, which Krasner wholeheartedly embraced. Her figure drawings and still lifes done under Hoffman's guidance showed her mastery of this approach, which emphasized structural analysis and what he called the push-pull of color relationships. In spite of the fact that they were both working for the New York City WPA, Krasner and Pollock met only once during this period at an artist union party in 1936. She used to enjoy telling this story, by the way. Somewhat the worse for wear, he cut in on her, stepped on her feet as he tried to dance with her, and propositioned her. Her response was negative, as you might imagine, and she promptly forgot all about him until November 1941, when she was invited to participate in a group exhibition in which he was also included. His name was unknown to her, and so was his work. So she invited herself to his studio, just around the corner from hers, and uh, to, to see if his work passed muster. There's her studio was on 50, at 51 East 9th Street, and his was at 46 East 8th Street. When she first saw Pollock's paintings, she said she felt that he was ahead of her. In her 1960, in a 1967 typescript statement, now in the Lee Krasner papers in the Archives of American Art, she described her response to the initial studio visit, which if you've seen the Pollock movie with Ed Harris and Marcia Gay Harden, it is recreated in that film. Now remember, this is a girl from Brooklyn. What did I think? I was overwhelmed, bowled over, that's all. I saw those marvelous paintings. I felt as if the floor was sinking when I saw those paintings. You can tell I'm quoting her. Apparently, she was also bowled over by Pollock himself. They soon became lovers, and the following fall, she moved into his apartment. In a 1981 interview with Grace Gluck of the New York Times, she discussed her response to Pollock's work in relation to her own development, specifically her acceptance of Hoffman's neo-cubist dicta. I was much more struck by what he, that is Pollock, was about, she told Gluck. It opened a new channel, a new avenue for me. I started to break away from what I had learned and was involved with. She began, as she put it, to lose cubism and absorb Pollock. But she insisted she never, quote, became a Pollock. I didn't because I wasn't a student of his in that sense. I admired him but also Mondrian and Matisse. One admires other artists, and I think I'd have admired him whether or not I was his wife. He'd have affected me." Unquote. In the early days of their union, Krasner was constantly confronted with and challenged by Pollock's powerful expressive imagery, which seemed to arise spontaneously from some deep creative wellspring. She tried to tap a similar reservoir within herself but kept missing the mark. She'd work on a painting for months at a time, adding layer upon layer until the surface resembled mud. Then, so it shouldn't be a total loss, the frugal Krasner would soak those failed canvases in the bathtub, scrape them down, and give them to Pollock to paint on. Quote, I was putting masses of paint on canvas and nothing would happen, she later recalled, just tons of paint going nowhere. It was all very frustrating." Unquote. This is the only canvas surviving from that time. Ironically, it bears the name of her former lover, Igor Pantuhov. Wonder if she was trying to send Jackson a message, 
like he wasn't the only pebble on the beach. However much Krasner was having, however much trouble Krasner was having creatively, she continued to promote Pollock's nascent career. By this time, he had been taken up by Peggy Guggenheim, who had commissioned the mural from him and had presented his first solo exhibition at her gallery, Art of This Century, the previous winter. Whatever competitive pressure Krasner may have felt in the privacy of their adjacent studios, in public, she was pardon, Pollock's ardent champion. The critic Clement Greenberg uh, recalled that in, uh, when she introduced him to Pollock, a virtual unknown when the two men met in late 1942 or early 1943, she declared, this guy is a great painter. The writer Lionel Abel, a friend from those years, summed up the opinion of many observers. She carried the ball for the enterprise, he said. She thought the whole thing out from beginning to end, how to put him over and how to make it a big success. It was Krasner's idea to move to the country in 1945, when Pollock's drinking and erratic behavior was threatening to derail the career she had cultivated with such determination for four, nearly four years. At first he resisted, but soon saw the wisdom of distancing himself from the city's plentiful temptations and distractions. They married in October and moved to this house in Springs in early November. Renting at first, well, excuse me, <clears throat> while Krasner negotiated a loan from Peggy Guggenheim that would enable them to buy the property and settle down. For the only time in their 14 year relationship, Krasner's studio arrangements took precedence over Pollock's. Since she apparently was never asked about it, nor did she volunteer the information, we can only speculate that her newfound domestic security prompted her to assert herself. She appropriated the back parlor, and this is what it looks like today. It definitely did not look like that when they moved in, but this is what we have now if you'll come and visit the museum. This is the biggest room in the house, and as you can see, it has a lovely bay window. In addition to abundant sunlight, the room was warmed by a Franklin stove, where you see that little uh, orange armchair, that's where the stove came out of the chimney. And together with the kitchen range, that was the building's only source of heat. Pollock set up shop in a chilly upstairs room, the smallest of the three on that floor, although it had the advantage of a north window. It also had privacy, which Krasner's workspace didn't, but compared to hers, it was cramped and spartan. Perhaps to compensate for the lack of heat, both painters experienced a burst of creative energy. Krasner emerged from her gray slab period with lively abstractions rendered in exuberant strokes of color, while Pollock began his Akabana Creek series, infusing his cryptic imagery with a new brightness and openness. By the spring, when Guggenheim's loan enabled them to get a mortgage, they took title to the property and Pollock began clearing out the barn that would become his studio. It was ready by the fall when he was already at work on the Sounds of the Grass series of all over abstractions. He showed 16 works from both series at Art of the Century the following January. Krasner completed only six paintings during that same period and here are two of them. But she was a slow worker who constantly revised and she was juggling her studio time with the domestic chores, which were arduous in a house with no indoor plumbing or central heating. Years later, when asked what it was like at first, she replied, how can I describe it? It was hell to put it mildly for me. Notwithstanding the hardships, she had found a new and fruitful direction in her work that would carry her through the rest of the decade. Once the barn was cleaned out and converted to Pollock's studio, Krasner moved into the former studio upstairs in the house where she worked for about 10 years. In that small room, which is only about 10 by 14 feet, she developed and refined her little image series of grid-based paintings executed in a heavily layered impasto and sometimes embellished with calligraphic pourings of liquid paint. Meanwhile, Pollock was rapidly progressing with the all over poured paintings that made him famous. Both artists were moving into uncharted territory, 
and often sought mutual reassurance. Although according to Krasner, they only visited each other's studios by invitation. Occasionally during this period, however much they valued their privacy, necessity caused their working and living space to overlap. In a 1976 interview with Barbara Rose, Krasner mentioned that when it was too cold to paint in the unheated studio upstairs, she would come down and work in the back parlor. The barn studio was also unheated, and although, according to Krasner, Pollock, quote, would manage in winter if he wanted to, he would get dressed up in an outfit the like of which you've never seen, with mufflers and sweaters and jackets piled on, he worked in the house when the barn got too cold. If this overlap caused any professional tension between them, it is not recorded. The awkwardness of the situation may have been eased by Pollock's brief period of sobriety from late 1948 through 1950, during which time he was taking tranquilizers. Again, it is speculation, but possibly this newfound equilibrium made it easier for Krasner to tolerate him underfoot. What we do know is that after central heating was installed in the house in late 1949, he, she worked exclusively in the upstairs studio, which Pollock entered by invitation only. And she equally respected his privacy. Her statements often refer to the arrangement whereby each would ask the other for assessments of work in progress. As she told Emily Wasserman in 1968, quote, generally I would preface it with a big bellyache about something. Then I'd list what was bothering me. And he would come into the studio and he'd say something like, oh, forget all that and just keep painting. It's a lot of rot, unquote. For his part, Pollock greatly valued his wife's opinion. As she told Wasserman, quote, he did keep saying, come and look, what do you think? I mean, that was a constant. So I take it that some part of my response was essential, you know, unquote. Whatever the other elements of their relationship may have been, their respect for each other's artistic integrity was surely an important, not to say crucial, component. This mutual sustenance, however, was nurtured and expressed in private. To the world at large, Krasner did not have a career in the professional sense of that term, meaning representation by a dealer who cultivated clients for the work and mounted annual solo shows that were reviewed in the press. But she did exhibit her work regularly, both in New York City and locally on Eastern Long Island. In fact, she and Pollock showed together in the 1948 Artists of the Region Invitational Exhibition at Guild Hall in East Hampton, that's the local cultural center, where her painting, possibly this one, won second prize, while his came in third. They showed together again at Guildhall in 1950, and the following year, at Pollock's urging, she had the first solo exhibition of her career at the Betty Parsons Gallery, where he had been represented since 1948. This is one of the few canvases that survived from that exhibition, and it is actually now in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. Indeed, ever since Peggy Guggenheim had given him his first solo show in 1943, Pollock had had annual exhibitions in New York every year. Guggenheim had also exposed his work in Venice, and he'd been included in important shows across the United States and in Europe. And a profile in Life magazine had broadcast his name to more than 5 million readers. By comparison, Lee was virtually unknown. The critics were kind to her 1941 Parsons show, but nothing was sold. It was four years before she had another. During this period, she evidently decided that she had outgrown the bedroom studio. Notwithstanding professional setbacks and whatever reticence she felt about competing with Pollock, she felt she needed a detached workspace like he had. In 1953, they bought an acre of land adjacent to their property and moved a small 19th century barn onto it with the intention of turning it into Krasner's studio. Although this has, it never became her primary workspace, especially since it had a dirt floor, no heat, and no electricity, her decision to establish a separate studio 
shows that she remained dedicated to her work in spite of her lack of professional recognition. From 1945 to 1955, when she exhibited her collage paintings in the Stable Gallery in Manhattan, Krasner's work underwent five distinct changes in direction, or breaks, as she called them. First, she abandoned the gestural exuberance inspired by her initial encounter with Pollock's work for the pointillistic technique and grid-like structure of the little image paintings, like Shattered Color. Then she made a series of geometric abstractions, which quickly gave way to a few transitional, expressionistic, uh, figure-based canvases, including her so-called personage paintings. And the one on the left, Lava, is an overpainted version of one of those that you saw on her easel when I showed the picture of her in the studio in 1950. So she had reworked that. And then it led to the color field abstractions that she showed at Betty Parsons. Almost all of those canvases later served as the basis for a series of collage paintings, which she began in 1943. And Milkweed, which is in the collection of the Albright Knox Art Gallery in Buffalo, is a good example. You can see the collage elements on top of a brushed, sort of semi-abstract uh, painting in the background. That's one of the Betty Parsons pictures from 1951. These abrupt changes in direction bespeak an aesthetic restlessness, a dissatisfaction, or perhaps a lack of confidence that plagued her throughout her relationship with Pollock. By the end of that relationship, Krasner had made yet another transition, abandoning the collage technique for a return to straight painting and the energetic brushwork and florid forms of her earlier expressionist phase. But the subject matter was figurative and decidedly ominous, perhaps in response to her deteriorating marriage. In early 1956, Pollock had begun an affair with a much younger woman, and he had stopped painting altogether while she was becoming increasingly confident and prolific. Yet in spite of having produced a solid body of work in the collage paintings, she had hardly received any critical recognition, much less made a sale. Amid such emotional and professional turmoil, is it any wonder that the images in her 1956 paintings like this one, which later came to be known as prophecy, seemed almost to be devouring themselves? And what's so prophetic about this canvas is that it's a bloated figure and you can see uh, on the, the facial area, there's a kind of a head wound there. That is what killed Pollock. He was thrown, his body was thrown out of his car against a tree and his head uh, was crushed. Following Pollock's death on August 11th, 1956 in a drunken car crash that also claimed the life of one of his passengers, Krasner faced her greatest challenge, managing his estate and her own career simultaneously. After spending the winter in a hotel in New York, she returned to Long Island in the spring and began to make the transition from the upstairs studio in the house to Pollock's barn studio, which you see here. To my knowledge, she never spoke directly on the record about that transition, except to say that it was a hard time for her. One can only imagine the emotional turmoil it took to empty the space of his work, which bore the indelible stamp of his personality, to tack a blank canvas on the wall against which his canvases had formerly been stacked, and to wait for something to, as she put it, suggest itself. Remember, neither of them worked from preliminary sketches or drawings. All of their work was what Paula called direct or spontaneous. What did suggest itself is utterly remarkable. Remember that this was a woman in deep mourning. Friends described her as being devastated by Pollock's death, beset by guilt, anger, and sorrow. Wouldn't those feelings be so, so evident to those who knew her be expected to manifest themselves in her work? What did come out of that emotional wellspring that she'd been trying to tap since her first encounter with Pollock's work was an explosion of voluptuous organic imagery rendered in lively brushwork and bright color, exactly the opposite of what might have been expected. Years later, when the poet Richard Howard questioned her about this seeming contradiction, she was at a loss to explain it. I remember, she said, that when I was painting Listen, 
which is so highly keyed in color. I've seen it many times since, and it looks like such a happy painting. I can remember that while I was painting it, I almost didn't see it because tears were literally pouring down." Unquote. If this was not exactly a joyous time for Krasner, it was a period of great achievement when what came to be known as the Earth Green series asserted her artistic independence. Her response to speculation about her motivations was often an evasive, noncommittal, I wouldn't know, or I couldn't say. In this case, however, it seems apparent that she was genuinely perplexed by the upbeat turn her work had taken in the face of her grief. Pollock's first biographer, B.H. Friedman, a close friend from those years, considered it to have been a kind of antidote to her negative feelings, as well as evidence of her determination to move forward with her life and career. Whatever the cause, the effect was to liberate the creative energy that had been suppressed while she concentrated on managing Pollock. Moreover, instead of a tiny room, she now had a spacious studio with high ceilings and 21-foot walls, and she made the most of it, enlarging both her format and her gesture. Krasner lived for 28 years after Pollock's death, and she used his former barn studio until severe arthritis and other health problems ended her productivity. This is the last painting she is known to have done there in the summer of 1982. The following December, she was photographed in front of what is believed to be her final work, a collage painting that illustrates her lifelong penchant for revisiting and recycling earlier material. It's made of drawings done in Hoffman's school in the late 1930s, collaged onto one of the few 1951 color field abstractions that she hadn't already reworked with new areas of paint added to unify the composition. This poignant final statement shows that for Lee Krasner, moving forward often involved a paradoxical dialogue with the past. Thank you so much for your attention and I will be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, so we had a question, Helen, from uh, let's see, here we go. A question from Lily Klima. What is liquid paint as opposed to other paint? Is oil not, it looks like liquid. Well, artist tube colors are a kind of paste. And in order to liquefy artist tube colors, you have to add something to thin them out, like a linseed oil or turpentine. When you add linseed oil, you make them sticky so they don't dry very quickly and they get very runny. If you add turpentine, they become rather um, translucent. You lose the um, intensity of the color. But in order to get a viscous finish or a viscous application with intense color, you need to use something like house paint because that will give you that effect. And that's the liquid paint that Pollock used, house paint. Lily, did that answer your question? Uh, more, more or less, thank you. Yes, I was just thinking how, how it relates to oil paint, because it look, that to me looks liquid also. Well, he did use oil paint uh, as well. He combined it with the uh, house paint, but not all of the paintings have it. Uh, it's, it's sometimes there's a combination, and he also added foreign matter, like sand or broken glass, or even the tops of tube paint. Uh, the, he, there's one painting that has a cigarette in it, uh, one that has a key. So it just depending, also one that has a hobby horse head on it. So he would sometimes collage or combine other elements with the painted surface. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, the next question was, can you comment on exhibit of Mexican muralists at the Whitney Museum? I hope COVID won't keep us from seeing the exhibit. That comes from Jackie Day. I wish I could, uh, but unfortunately I did not get to see it before the museum closed. I am familiar with the work that, that's in it though. And of course it was absolutely crucial for Pollock's formative experience to see the work of not only Siqueiros and Orozco, but also Diego Rivera 
In fact, there's a very cute story that was told to me by uh, one of his early dates, a, a woman he, he went around with when he was, they were both teenagers, and he took her on a date to watch Diego Rivera paint a fresco. That was their big night out. But the idea that the Mexicans were um, using indigenous subject matter, that they were dealing with apocalyptic and, and uh, big themes, and that their work was monumental in form, those were all things that appealed very much to him. And then, of course, with Siqueiros, the idea that you could use experimental materials, which uh, neither Orozco nor Rivera was doing, that was, I think, very formative for him. Jackie, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. I, I thought it was something, uh, I had no idea about the influence of the Mexican muralists on so many American artists. And uh, I, I think, I would love to see the exhibit. Also, I haven't seen it, and I don't know when these museums will reopen, but yeah. um, thank you very much. It was very interesting to hear what you said about Pollock and those influences. Thank you. Another question from Roseanne, what is cotton duck? Oh, cotton duck is a uh, sailcloth. It's uh, a lot of people use it as, as canvas. Pollock used to buy it on, in rolls from a sail maker in New York City and have it shipped out by UPS. Roseanne, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. I think that's all the questions I have here. So, Let's just open it up. If anybody has a question, if they want to just raise their hand, I can go through and see if anybody else has any other questions. I see Lily has a question. Okay. I see Michelle. Yeah. Michelle? Yes. Go ahead. Um, uh, I just wondered why do you think that Lee Krasner never achieved the fame that uh, Jackson Pollock had? Well, Pollock was an innovator. Uh, not that he invented the technique that he used. In fact, he said, uh, I, it's not unusual to work on the floor. The Orientals did that. Uh, he was not claiming to have somehow invented it out of whole cloth. But the fact that he moved modern art beyond the school of Paris, that abstraction that he, that he was able to innovate not only abstract technique, but abstract imagery, and that his work was recognized as innovative by the European avant-garde was what made him so influential. Lee did not do that. Not that her work isn't um, uh, important or uh, of a high quality, but it, is, does not, it did not move the dialogue beyond where it had been before. So that's the difference. Thank you. Okay. And I saw a few other hands. Oh, Let's Lois Mazur. Hello, Lois. It's so good to hear from you. Haven't seen her in a long time. We used to work okay. very closely okay. together when she was uh, in Let the me get to office. her. Okay, Lois, you said? Lois. Hang Lois Mazur. Yeah. There you go. Hey, hi, Lois. Oh, so good to see you. That was so interesting. You need to tell everybody about the house. <laughs> oh, sure. Well, when, when, whenever we finish up with questions, I'll be happy to do that. Yeah, I, Lily had a question. Okay. Lily Klima? Yeah. Thank you. My Lily, go ahead. I, she didn't sell very much. You said she worked for about four years without selling anything. Was uh, she being supported by whom? Was well, they lived on the sale money? of his work. Remember, he had a dealer. At first, it was Peggy Guggenheim. Then it was Betty Parsons. And then from 1952 until his death and immediately after, it was Sidney Janis. And these people would market the work. Now, after he died, Lee had a dealer herself. And she did have very good representation. She was first with Howard Wise who was a very good dealer. Then from Howard Wise, she went to Marlborough Gallery, which was based in London, but had opened a New York branch in the early 60s and also represented the Pollock estate for a while. Then from Marlborough, she went to Pace Gallery, 
which as you know is a mega gallery and was very important then too. And from there, she went to Robert Miller, who was her last dealer during her lifetime. Her estate is now represented by Kasman. So she had excellent representation, but not while he was alive. So that's the difference. So she was being supported by him while yes. he was yes. alive and she was not earning money. Right. She didn't have a benefactor at the time. Or uh -huh, if only. Well, Peggy, of course, was their benefactor in the early days. She, they had a contract with her, which uh, gave him a stipend, a kind of a monthly allowance which was in fact an advance against sales. So he would um, give her, he would give Peggy the work, she would sell it and pay herself back. And if she got to a certain level, then he would get a commission, the same as you would do from a normal dealer. But she very often did not sell enough. He wasn't well known at that point. So she would take back the work. And at one point she had, oh, something like 25 of his pieces many of which she distributed around as gifts to various museums. That big mural from 1943 eventually wound up at the University of Iowa, which took it as a gift in 1951. And in fact, it is now at the Guggenheim in New York. Unfortunately, we can't go see it because it's closed. But that mural was um, uh, something that Peggy gave away. She did not take it to Venice with her, but she took quite a lot of his work to Venice and showed it in Venice a couple of times and also lent it to different venues around Europe. So exposing him in Europe was very, very important because it showed that she who collected, you know, the creme de la creme of modern art, that she gave him her seal of approval and put him right up there with the modern masters. And that really helped to establish his reputation. So you see behind every man is a very good woman. <laughs> well, he even admitted it. He said, I'd be dead without her. So, I mean, I don't think you can get more of an accolade than that. But the idea that she, uh, as, as Lionel Ableton, she understood how to put him across. That was very important. She really knew how the art world worked. And I asked her biographer, Gail Levin, what, who knew her quite well, I asked her what she learned about Lee while writing the biography that she didn't, that she hadn't known before. And she said, I never appreciated how shrewd she was. So from uh, the point of view of Pollock's career, I think she was absolutely instrumental. Okay. I see a hand from Roger Price. Oh, we can't hear you yet, Roger. Hang on. Roger, we can't okay, hear there you. Go. Okay, I'm, go ahead, I'm, Roger. Unmuted. I'm unmuted now, okay. Which is rare, I'm, uh, I'm unmuted. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to mention that a number of years ago, we had an Ollie trip out to Spring uh, Springs to see the uh, Pollock House and the Pollock Krasner House. And it was very interesting. Uh, I'm looking, I was, it was kind of interesting looking at the photographs that you had in your presentation. And I couldn't get over how he painted on the floor. And there's still remnants of the paint that overlapped the, uh, the canvases that he was painting on. I, I, was, I was fascinated by it. I never really understood his painting, but I, I found it fascinating. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you came. And of course, it was, both one, it was them, a wonderful trip. They were both very energetic action painters and you can see a lot of her marks on the wall. But f unfortunately, from our point of view, she had them painted over at one point. So not yeah. all of the marks are that visible the way they are in Pollock's case because the floor was covered up in 1953 when they renovated the building. And so uh, everything that he had laid down on the floor from 1946 through 1952 was preserved. So when you all come out, which I hope you will when we reopen, we're actually closed for the season now. So we wouldn't normally be open anyway, but we will be, we hope reopening in May. And if not, uh, well, you know, we'll just play it by ear. But you can, in the meanwhile, go to our website and click on the home page, take the audio tour. And that will give you images, uh, the commentary, and also it's, it's in printed form. So you can get a kind of uh, virtual tour that way. And I also put it out in the Ali newsletter. There was a link for the video chat tour. So take a look at the email that just came out um, last week. 
Let's see if there's any other questions. Yeah, on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock, we're doing video chat tours with our educator, Joyce Raimondo. She takes people through the property, and then she does a little workshop with materials that you can use, uh, get, find at home. And I have Faye Graber. She was raising her hand. Faye, go ahead. Oh, would you call, would you call uh, Pollock the father of abstract expressionism? Or, or perhaps maybe Kandinsky was the, maybe the spiritual father of abstract expressionism. Because well, that's what should that's ask what that. <laughs> because what? I say it's funny you should ask that because I, I did actually write an essay called The Birth of Abstract Expressionism for yeah. a, a publication that we did in conjunction with a series of uh, symposiums that we had uh, about 10 years ago. And in fact, it was a reaction against German Expressionism, and it actually dates from 1919. A guy named Oswald Herzog wrote an essay called Der Abstract Expressionismus. He, in fact, coined the term. It was not coined in the United States, and it was a, a, uh, an essay in a uh, publication called Der Sturm, which was a post-war Berlin publication that talked about what Kandinsky also talked about, the spiritual element in abstract yes. art going beyond yeah. the material. They felt that German Expressionism, as it had been up to that point, was too materialistic, too much based on um, the real physical world, and that abstract Expressionism should go on to a higher level of experience. So that was its, its origin when um, Alfred Barr of the Museum of Modern Art applied the term to American art, he uh, downplayed the spiritual aspect and thought, perhaps felt that it was too airy-fairy, I don't know, for whatever reason. But he did refer back to Kandinsky. And both Kandinsky and Hans Hoffmann, who of course was Lee's teacher, were interested in that element, that aspect of it. Yes, Kandinsky is one of my heroes. Yeah, but it did actually originate with Oswald Herzog in 1919. That's where the term comes from. Yes, thank and you. If you read uh, William Seitz's book on abstract expressionism, which was his dissertation, he is the one who identified that. And that was, that was a, a citation that was given to him by Peter Sells, who only just died, but who was in Berlin back in those days and who knew where it had come from. So okay, would you repeat that. his... Would you repeat that name? I'd like to read it. Repeat the name. Oh, uh, William Seitz, S-E-I-T-Z, and his book S is, S -E -I, I forget the exact title, but if you, if you Google it, you'll find it under Abstract Expressionism, and it was his Okay, thank you so much. Yes. I think it was published in the 80s. I think it has a, a, um, an introduction by Robert Motherwell. But uh, it was written in 1955 originally, but it wasn't published until I think even after Seitz's death. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Raise your hand, please. Let's see if we have any, any other questions here. Are you seeing anybody? Any questions? Any other questions? All right, I think that's, looks like that's about it. Um, Helen, did you want to say something else about the Paula Krasner House or any, any last comments or? Well, as I say, we won't, we on? normally would open uh, the first Thursday in May, but this year, things being what they are, we are taking reservations in order to come for a visit. Anybody from Stony Brook, there's no charge. If you did want to come, you should call us ahead so that we can give you a, a a coupon code so you won't have to pay for the ticket, but you do need to reserve online. So you go to our website, you look it up uh, where it says visiting us and you'll get, you'll see the buttons and then you can make a reservation. Uh, as I say, we are taking reservations because the groups are limited. So we should be able to open and let people come around, come on a guided tour and keep, you know, a proper social distance and all that but uh, we are just kind of playing it by ear right now. I see that the Gittens have a copy of Convergence on their wall, the poster behind them. Yay. <laughs> Yay, Pollock. 
Yeah, there it is. <laughs> That's up in the Albright Knox Art Gallery as well. All right. Well, we want to thank you, Helen, again for um, doing this wonderful lecture. We hope everyone enjoyed it. And that concludes uh, our lecture series today with Helen Harrison. So thank I'm you so much for, for coming. For I really minute. appreciate everyone.